A night of legend. Gale of Doc? <laughs> that would be a legendary night. Fuck. This hotel had absolutely nothing to brag about. There was no air conditioning. It was hot, stuffy, damp, and you'd say sweaty, no matter how much you wiped off. Throw in the smell and the lack of any interior decorating, and anyone would want to check out right away. Unfortunately, the biggest problem with this concrete hotel was that none of the guests were allowed to check out. What? When some policemen appeared in the hallway, hands stretched out of the barred windows here and there, and people muttered with discontent. Oh, fucking prison. Or holding, I guess. God damn it. Hey, officer, what am I supposed to have done? Why was I the only one arrested? That American's the one who started the fight. Shut up, Jab. The pits. The stink here is bad enough to curl your nostrils. Hitting the arms that stretch out from behind the bars with their nightsticks, the policeman I had headed deeper in. Here we are. Now get the hell out of here. Your boyfriend's come to get you out. Thank God, Leo. True king. In the dismiss, uh, in the dimness of the innermost cell, Rose crouched, holding her legs. The policeman said something and led Rose out, but she was beyond noticing. The moment that Wayne and Claudia had been swallowed by the Crimson Inferno that night was still burned into her eyes. Yeah, that's really traumatic. Because I didn't take personal responsibility for the ideals I spoke of, everyone would be sacrificed. That is not true. At this rate, it won't stop at Wayne and Claudia. Many, many more of them will be sacrificed one after another. I have to get my hands dirty. You literally were shooting. I have to become a dragon. Rose! Oh, it's just Butler. Captain? The person waiting for her in what seemed to be a drawing room was the Butler. Why the fuck would the MPs defer to Butler as her boyfriend? What? When he gave a gesture indicating that it was okay to go, the policeman left. I didn't want to meet you in the clink. Well, at any rate, I'm glad you're safe. Those words fell deeply ironic to Rose now. Sure, she was safe, but at what cost? What cost? However, what happened because her friends had become human sacrifices? If I had been prepared to dirty my hands sooner, no one would have had to be sad. I won't ask what happened at the pier. It really is sad. I used to like City 23. It was somehow peaceful at this eastern tip of the world. And like some frantic, bustling metropolis. But what about now? Thanks to single man, everything's been ravaged. It's my fault for not having the result needed to stop Caleb. There's no helping it. The opponent was an unfortunate match. Our higher-ups also miscalculated Caleb. Their clumsy greed ended up costing them a lot. By now, Caleb's a wounded tiger. Now he's the same as a bomb with the fuse lit. Since the time Caleb was attacked in front of the occupying forces headquarters, he had grown extremely cautious. He had some hidden somewhere in the city, and it seemed only a small group of his inner circle even knew where he was. To the American higher-ups, who had wanted to wring out a lot of money out of Caleb, he was now little more than a troublemaker they wanted eliminated. Well, yeah, he's a loose end. However, not only were they unable to pinpoint Caleb's position, but Caleb was making frequent phone calls to check how the handover was progressing. They made excuses saying that negotiations were encountering difficulties, but it probably wouldn't be long until before Caleb's patience snapped. When that happened, there would be war. Before that happened, the occupying forces would have to eliminate Caleb. The Gale family was like a balloon filled to the bursting with gas of discontent. If Caleb was eliminated, it would pop and disappear like a soap bubble. However, if you pop a bubble, bubble the spray will always cover everything around it. The problem was who they could get to pop that bubble. Rose, how you doing? Slaps her on the back. <laughs> ah, good luck. If I could have stopped Caleb sooner. You can't go back into the past. The best time is always right now. True. Yeah, right now. I have to become a dragon. A dragon? Yeah, to save my countrymen. I intend to become a dragon. To take responsibility for my ideals, I must become a dragon. 
What does becoming a dragon mean? It means stopping Caleb with my own hands. Are you firm in your resolve? Yes, even if it means we end up killing each other. Butler didn't notice that there was something darker than what he knew in Rose's eyes. Of course, he hadn't thought that she would start talking about something like this. However, it wasn't hard to imagine that she had undergone many painful thoughts since the Kale family took power. So, even hearing such savage words coming from her mouth didn't seem out of place to him. Though thinking about what she must be feeling struck, struck him with the desire to just run away. His heart raced ruthlessly. The frigid abacus in his chest was calculating her current value to them. Ding ding, get me. Unless something's done about Caleb, City 23 will be destroyed. Yes. Whether it's by peaceful methods or otherwise, unless Caleb's stopped, it's all over. I'm prepared to do that. I see. You might be the only one who can do it, after all. Yes, only I can do it. It was impossible for the American army to find Caleb, now that he had gone underground. However, Rose could surely find him. Surely even Caleb would show himself to, if Rose went. This is a fight between Japanese people to save our Japanese countrymen. And so, I must get my hands dirty. I got it. I got it. I see how firm your resolve is, Rose. What do you need now? Tell me anything you need, I'll get it for you. This is to make up for being unable to help you at the, your lowest point. Ask for anything you like and I'll get it right away. Then a gun. Of course, and? A bomb. You want a grenade or dynamite? I'll get it for you. We'll have to talk about how and where you're going to use it. Dynamite. I'll hide, on my per I'll hide it on my person. Get close to Caleb and blow up him up along with myself. Uh, Ro... That's the only, thing, only way for me to take responsibility for raising my dragon and being unable to get my hands dirty. Give me a bomb, Captain. Because they got involved with my ideas, Wayne and Claudia and many more people have lost their lives. I had to take responsibility for that. I have to become a dragon. I have to become a dragon. Rose's eye pupils grew even more clouded by the course, uh, curse of the dragon's tongue. That ghastly look made even Butler gulp. Uh, no. <laughs> no bomb for you. You're fucking crazy. I guess we're just not gonna ever go back to fucking Julie or whatever. That night, Rose was in a high-class apartment in the Newtown District, or Newton District. The large building had been used as a guest house for American officers visiting from the mainland. So the whole area was under the supervision of the American army and no unauthorized pe people could even approach it. These days, there could be no safer place for Rose in the city. Rose was laying down on a sofa. She had only planned to take a short nap, but it was already in the middle of the night. At some point, a basket of bread, a bottle of mineral, mineral water, a handgun, and a large present box had been set on the table. Wow, thanks. Hey, is that jo jo Joan of Arc? It was a message card from Butler. Because it looks like it. That looks like a fucking standard bear. It said she could use this room however she liked. It didn't say anything about the present. Uh, present. Even so, she knew what was inside it. Inside, there were several sticks of dynamite and grenades. Yeah, just fucking grenade him. There was even a military vest that would make it easy to wear them on her person. With this much strapped to my body, I'll probably be able to massacre everyone within a radius of 10 meters. That's not even that much. Of course, before a moment passed, she would probably become a red cloud in the center. But that's okay. That way, I'll finally be able to carry out my responsibility. When I actually touched it and felt its weight, my heart leapt at once. With this, next time I'll definitely... As though to help burden the half-dried concrete of det her determination to die, 
Rose quickly put the military vest on. Then after, then she attached the dynamite sticks to her vest, one after another. She could feel that she had become a walking weapon. No, a walking bomb. However, this way, she would surely be spotted no matter how she tried to hide it within a, within a jacket. It would probably be best to carry them under her skirt. However, as she watched this unusual picture of herself reflect in the mirror, she could feel herself growing calmer. Calmer and calmer. I don't like this, Rose. Can they just come up alive already so she doesn't have to blow people up? Several people who trusted me died. What a fucking loser. I've got to stop Caleb. That's the only way I can take responsibility. Even though I've supposedly grown calm. Even though my heart has stopped racing, my head has started throbbing like an alarm bell. The me in the mirror is starting to twist itself into some sort of bizarre monster. It's not just the inside of the mirror, the mirror, the wall, the room, the ceiling. All of it began to twist. I've got to. I've got to. I've got to become a dragon quickly. Rose with her gentleness and her straightforwardness, her stubbornness, and her doubtly strong sense of responsibility. Doubly was the type that could be influenced most deeply by the dragon's tongue. However, too many things had happened one after another. The feeling of responsibility she bore was becoming a monster ready to swallow her whole. That bizarre monster puffed up her, uh, puffed up by the mad vest filled with dynamite was staring, staring right at Rose from beyond the mirror. I've gotta become a dragon. I've gotta become a dragon. Because I had taken up a dragon's ideals, everyone's been sacrificed. I've got to take personal responsibility for taking up a dragon's ideals. Stop. I've got to. I've got to. Stop. Stop. I've got to become a dragon. I've got to become a dragon. All your cheap talk, cheap talk led to a lot of people dying. So you have to die too. No. Is that coat some new fashion? With that sudden voice, the fog surrounding Rose's head cleared in an instant. We're just gonna fuck, and she's gonna be like, hey, I'm feeling a lot better now. Some, something tickled her nose. After that, that uh, smell of tobacco was something that always surrounded her. That coat doesn't suit you. Next break I, break I get, I'll pick you a new one. Leo? A hot tear dripped down from Rose's right eye. How long had he been there? He'd probably knock several times. However, I was being swallowed by the beast inside, and it didn't reach my ears. Come here. Leo was standing in front of Rose's eyes, closing the door behind him while giving a little sigh and smiling. Then, with a straightforward, bitter grin at Rose's violent and unsuitable outfit, he crushed his cigarette in a portable ashtray. As she looked at his expression, several feelings that had been uh, numbed in Rose were revived. Leo slowly stretched out his fingers and pulled a out one of the dynamite sticks packed into Rose's chest pocket. Is some kind of new kind of lipstick? Still, it's a bit too big. The scent doesn't suit you either. <laughs> Leo touched the end of the dynamite stick to Rose's lips. Even though it was just that, it felt extremely ticklish, and Rose made a sound without thinking about it. That was how far she had been paralyzed. Normal feelings and thoughts kept coming back to her. Why am I in a place like this? Why am I holding so much dynamite? Why am I preparing to die? If I, if I don't at least die, how can I take responsibility? For what? Because of my cheap talk, so many people suffer. Because of me, Wayne and Claudia, they wouldn't die. No, they did die right in front of my eyes. What have I been doing? So much has happened. It might have made me different. They told me to come alone if I wanted Wayne and Claudia to live. So you decided to walk right into their trap. There was no time to hesitate. I didn't know what to do. I felt I had to do it. That I had to throw away my life. And then Wayne and Claudia came to save me. And for my sake, for my sake, huh? And that's why you have to die. After all, Everyone's lost their lives from my cheap talk. In that case, I've got to give up my life, too. We aren't risking our lives because we want you to die. You being alive will accomplish something more than us being alive. 
Because we believe that, we put our lives on the line. For my cheap talk? You think it can protect our countrymen and guide them? That's right. For your cheap talk. Simple cheap talk, which would die a useless death if left only to words. Even though I have to do something, I don't know what that is. Even I realize it's nothing but cheap talk if all you do is talk about it. I realize I have to take the lead and dirty my own hands if I want to save my countrymen. So I have to do this. I can't think of any other way to take responsibility. No, there is a way. What way? It's true that you have to be prepared to get your hands dirty if you wanted to make your cheap talk a reality. You can't protect any country or anyone's freedom without the resolve to dirty your hands. For example, let's imagine that we're on a big ore-driven boat called Japan. <laughs> okay. Someone's got to rub those oars and get blisters on their hands. That's what it means to dirty your hands. However, no matter how powerfully they row those oars at random, they'll never get anywhere. It has to all be in rhythm. Someone has to be calling the orders. Someone's got to be the shouter. If you move at random, you might wander lost at the ocean, or you might hit a rock and sink. We have the strength to row those oars. However, we don't know how to use a map and a compass. We're not even close to seeing which directions we should be going, moving the boat in. Yes. But you can see it. Your heart will be our telescope. Showing us the way to a future we can't see. You're saying that's what cheap talk is? That's not it. I'm talking about the direction our boat is heading towards. If we float around a misty ocean with no direction, near destination, that's the same as being adrift. However, if the captain assures the crew that there's a destination behind the fog, they can pluck up their courage. But you see now, rowing oars isn't the only way to get your hands dirty. Becoming the captain, standing at the head, and leading the crew of rowers is also an important job. Uh -huh. You just have to show us the way. We'll row the boat in that direction. At first, it might look like you aren't getting your hands, your own hands dirty. But that's wrong. They're so fucking dirty. You'll be our captain and order us to, order us to dirty our hands. By ordering many rowers to dirty their hands, you'll be dirtying your own hands more than anyone else. I had it wrong, didn't I? I thought the madam had to try harder than anyone else to take on the dirty jobs herself. But I had it wrong, didn't I? Your spirit wasn't wrong. You just mistook what it meant to get your hands dirty. Yes. This is the same as the military. A, vi a hundred violent people on their own are no better than bandits. However, when they're commanded by a single leader who has earned their trust, their power becomes many times greater and it becomes possible for them to perform a just service. I don't need to explain anymore, right? Yeah. All of us. Richard, Cyrus, and of course me. And Wayne, Claudia, Stella, and Meryl too. Every last one of us has considered you to be the most fitting person to be our captain, and we've acknowledged you as the madam. Yet, I've misunderstood what the captain's job is. That's right, the captain's job is to stay in the captain's room and look at maps and compasses. But instead, you let that go undone and start wiping the deck. Cleaning is a job for us low-level soldiers. You have a job as the captain, a job that only you can do. Yeah. I understand now. However, when I saw Wayne and Claudia lose their lives, I wanted to lose the same thing. If I didn't, my heart would be crushed. That's the captain's heavy burden. That's you getting your hands dirty. Even so, you've got to hold your head up high. The captain has to keep do looking only towards their destination. And I was trying to take the easy way out and abandon that duty. There's no helping it. Primavera is in the military. It's not like you went through any training or classroom learning when you became a madam. But maybe I did. I seem to remember Amanda telling me strictly and repeatedly that the madam should be ruthless and heartless. 
that the madam must not act friendly with the common people. No, you can still act friendly. I thought that I was, I was just in charge of taking care of people, sort of like being a class president. I may be their representative, but there was certainly nothing grandiose about my position. So thinking that, I'd only listen to what half of what she was trying to tell me about the rules of being a madam. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. Being the madam is a very lonely and heavy job. By now, I can finally see part of that. Now I'm sure I understand. I can understand those duties of the madam that Amanda spoke of. My eyes grew hot. Warm tears dripped from them one after another. What a foolish madam I was. I didn't need to take responsibility for saying all that cheap talk. I need to take responsibility for calling my words cheap talk. This time, I need to bear responsibility for my ideals. For some reason, when I was listening to Lee talk about dragons, I started to feel that I had to take the responsibility by my own hands. I won't misunderstand anymore. I wouldn't, won't misunderstand what it is Wayne and Claudia entrusted me with. Thank you, Leo. Wearing something like this, I must really be an idiot. You got that right, it's scary as hell. Also, my family code forbids me from trying to pick up chicks with dynamite strapped to them. <laughs> you can't even smoke when I'm like this, can you? Leo was stubbornly chewing an unlit c cigarette. Rose giggled and sat down on the bed. Hell yes! The soft, of it, soft feel of it spread throughout her whole body. It felt as though it was cleansing the curse that enveloped her. Leo, tell me something. What should I do? There are a lot of things. I don't... I won't misunderstand my resolution beliefs as the madam anymore. But I don't know what I should start by doing. You might want to tell everyone you've reached that decision. Then you could ask whether they're willing to entrust their lives to you. <laughs> Didn't Wayne say it a long time ago? At, at that time. That he would throw away his life from me. He did. Even though I was entrusted with something that important, I was so thoughtless. I'm sorry, Wayne. If Wayne's action spurred you on, to, on into finding your resolve as the motto, I'm sure he must be celebrating. Wayne's another one who would rather be thanked than apologized to. Yeah, you're right. But whatever you're going to do, let's leave that until tomorrow. For now, your first job is to take off this badly fitting coat. Leo leaned over and undid the belt and buttons on Rose's military vest. When her arm slipped out of the sleeves, the missing vest fell to the bed with a thunk. My shoulders feel unbelievably light. It's not just the weight of the dynamite and the vest that are gone. It's many more things besides. Thank you, Leo. If you hadn't come, I would have died alone without understanding anything. So you're planning to you were planning to make a raid with dynamite strapped all over your body and that handgun in your hand? With my clumsy shooting arm, which only which you only got to train a little. Yes. Hmm? When the fingers that had removed the vest touched the ribbon on her chest, Rose's body shook. Hell yeah, my dude! Don't tell me you were planning to sleep in a formal outfit like this, right? Oh, I wasn't, but... <laughs> yes! Without hesitation, Leo's fingers undid the strings of her corset. Then his hands covered her shoulders. Those hands were big and hot, and just the touch of them felt as though it would burn her. Leo. Leo's hands spread the, sho spread the shoulders of Rose's clothes, and slowly brought them down. Then, still holding Rose's thin arms, he slowly pushed her down onto the soft futon. My boy. Getting it in. Leo! Wait, I, uh, um... Her sweaty, steaming chest was exposed to the air, and the smell of her own sweat made Rose's face turn red. However, with Leo holding her arm, she couldn't resist. Leo slowly brought his face closer to Rose. Then he whispered into her ear. When I was teaching you how to shoot, we made a promise. <laughs> yes? I'm not thinking about that. <laughs> you swore you didn't fight. You wouldn't fight alone. But wasn't that a joke? A joke? I wouldn't sleep with you for a joke. Yes! Ha! This time, I'll make you truly mine. My man. My heart was racing. My head was spinning. And I didn't know what was going on anymore. But for some reason, fear was the one thing I didn't feel. Because Leo's painfully strong arms held me so that my heart would never get lost again. My boy. 
doing the Lord's work. Time frame. Yeah, hello. Sorry to call so late. <laughs> I've been calling you for an hour. <laughs> Wonderful, butler. Thanks to you calling me before the day is out. Peace will reign in City 23 for another night. How many times do I have to tell you not to threaten me before you'll understand? Or is my Japanese worse than I think? Won't you tell me how I can explain this to you? You'll get the wrong idea, butler. I'm not threatening you. I just want us to pray together for peace and safety in City 23's fellow residents. The city's filled with people crazier than Alfred. Yeah, you. Those, there are men all possessed by the ghosts of the time we called you the vicious Americans and British. I've been keeping an eye out and keeping them in line, bud. But something might happen that makes them start hunting American citizens from bell towers. Or a reckless truck driver might run over a good American family. You don't want to start a war! You already lost one! That's a relief, so thanks to you we don't have to deal with tragedies like that. Exactly. I'm working in my own way to prevent it needless blood from being shed in this city. Calum continued to threaten calmly from the other end of the phone call. He had no time. He'd gathered the hundred million by force, saying that everyone's lives would change if they did so. Unless the occupying forces made some sort of visible move, even Caleb wouldn't be able to wipe away the discontent from the lower ranks. Butler listened closely to this, paying attention to what hid behind Caleb's tone. The higher-ups had already given the order to assassinate Caleb. Even if Caleb piled up another hundred million, or two hundred million, they'd already decided not to deal with him. The order given to Butler was to deal with, Caleb the prob uh, with the Caleb problem before he started up trouble. However, since the failed sniping the other day, Caleb had gone into hiding and never appeared in public. Caleb was demanding that they decide on a fixed date, when the Americans would show the outcome of their deal in some tangible way. And he was also making a threat, saying that it would be difficult to prevent the outbreak of several unfortunate accidents or crimes if they didn't comply. Butler wanted to find some way to take Caleb out of the picture, he was buying time to do that. Caleb, on the other hand, wanted to show off the results of his effort in some visible way as soon as possible. After all, his biggest failure, which he now re recognized, was inspiring his underlings, underlings too much with the idea that the results would appear immediately after gathering a hundred million. Butler wanted to halt Caleb's impending rampage, whatever the cost. Caleb wanted to achieve some sort of result while he still had the power to hold men together. The two goals were countering each other from either side of the phone line. Their execs say they'd like to meet with you soon. We'll work to make that happen as fast as reasonably possible. So would you take that as a sign of our sincerity? It was a complete fabrication. They had never made any uh, accommodations for Caleb. Please realize that I have been stuck in a meeting until this late precisely because of the efforts we're making. They may not resist giving up what they have to Americans, but they didn't realize they'd be handing it over to the Asians. Well, you see, just like the Japanese talk about the vicious Americans and British, the people back in the States used to call their enemies uncivilized barbarians and so on. If you want to see whether we're civilized or not, all you have to do is meet with me. I can talk with money like a civilized person, or I can talk with strength like an uncivilized one. Wonderful. Which attitude I take is all up to you. I'm hoping for this matter to be resolved in a prompt and gentlemanly fashion. I'm a gentleman. So are you. Then we should be able to settle this peacefully. Gail back did calm. However, on the inside, the unexpected delays were making him frantic enough to want to scratch at his own body. Even though both sides were in an explosive situation, neither the one of them had wanted, um, admitted it. I'll contact you as soon as they finalize their schedule. I promise that to do that by this weekend. That's all for now, Caleb. Good night. Bowers set the receiver down. <laughs>